we were being told that inflation is transitory and actually there's no way it was transitory we were all experiencing at you know toilet paper shooting up the roof in terms of how expensive toilet paper was getting and other items we were seeing shrinkflation all these other elements were coming into the mix that were not being reported and we felt we needed to track that and so you know it's it's no long you know shrinkflation how do you track shrimp shrinkflation you know the different size packets and you were alluding it to it it's it with salt or without salt right ingredients get extracted sizes get smaller prices may stay the same but the size is smaller how do you take that into account in 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 a whole mix and and so those are all elements that we challenge our analytics team day in day out to sort of filter out and weight accordingly All right, guys, bang, bang, I've got Stefan here. Uh, I thought a great place to start is inflation is obviously something that everyone debates. There's the kind of government statistics. They say inflation got high, about 9%, and then it came down a little bit. Uh, there's people on the internet who say, no, you liars. It went way higher than that. You guys are all lying to us, and I'm not getting to keep up with inflation because it's rising too quickly. Why is it so heavily debated? Shouldn't this just be math? One plus one equals two. Why can people not agree on what the actual inflation rate is? Well, you'd think so, right? But um, yeah, thanks for having me back, by the way, and, and glad people are paying attention and, and interested in the topic inflation. Uh, totally underestimated how big a topic it was going to be and, and is currently still. Um, but that said, you know, if you think about it, it's there's a scorecard for an economy is generally viewed as one metric and that is inflation, right? People just look at how is the economy performing, performing, and that is inflation. And if you go back and look at who calculates inflation, how is it calculated, and what is the methodology, all of those elements are under the same house, right? So the same people that actually, you know, perform the economy or manage the economy are the same ones driving the scorecard, are the same ones driving the actual methodology and how to score an economy, and then going to collect the data that feeds into the score. So too many, you know, mixed and conflict of interests, I think, involved in that whole process. And so that's why we really felt that, number one, we need to automate that process. Number two is we need to provide transparency, immutability to it, and then ultimately get a independent source for inflation. Now, if the inflation number is wrong, the CPI number that the government is using, where does that have the biggest impact? Is that just like it poorly informs central bankers in terms of monetary policy decisions? Does it poor, poorly inform consumers yeah. uh, in terms of their purchasing decision? Does it poorly inform investors? Where, where do you see the biggest negative impact? So biggest impact is obviously inflation is is a hidden tax, right? I mean, ultimately, your va the value of the money that you've saved gets debased. So we lose in terms of purchasing power, and that has a significant impact. The other element, think about it, governments today around the world have some $4.4 trillion in inflationary linked bonds. These are loans that they give out um, and ask people to give them money and guarantee those loans against inflation plus interest on top of that. Ultimately, the interest is lower because they're guaranteeing inflation. So in real terms, which is an ec economic um, you know, name for actually saying we are above inflation, we're outperforming inflation, and ultimately they're calculating inflation and then giving you an interest right out, uh, associated with that $4.4 trillion. That's quite a significant number, and that has a significant impact that until trueflation, it has always been taken for as granted, you know, the numbers are again provided by the BLS and we can issue 4.4 trillion. Um, and, and our view is, you know, we need to change that and have an independent source to accurately reflect how investors get rewarded. When you see um, them going into the stores, right? The uh, Bureau of Labor yeah. Statistics sends people physically into a store with a tablet and they got to go and look for the exact soup <laughs> with no salt, right? And make sure that they get it correct. Um, yeah. You all are taking this automated approach. Explain, like, wh where are you finding the data? How are you making sure that the data you're you're using as an input is accurate? Uh, and then, how often are you checking to see whether that data has changed or not? So there, we check every every day. Or, I mean, in some cases, you don't really need to check every day. So we check every week. In some of the bigger cases, we check every month. So we come in all different time intervals um, for groceries. I mean, we break down 
contrast to the government that ca- that breaks it down into six categories, we have 12 subcategories that we track the data in. We have 18 million items versus 80,000 items. So ultimately, a significant larger um, portfolio of items that we track. We have three price feeds per item. All of that, ultimately, we get updated through multiple different channels. They can come through actually the grocery stores, which are sharing their sort of receipts at the teller, you know, sort of uh, point of sales. So we get that information. We get it through IoT devices. We get it through barcode readers. We get it um, through API feeds from the various outlets, uh, from car gurus, uh, from, from Zillow, from Trulia, you name it, sort of all the different sites. And more and more so, we're also getting it and including sort of synthetic assets associated with real world assets into the mix. So we get a, just a different perspective of how prices are changing. I mean, the reason why we got into this in the first place is we were being told that inflation is transitory. And actually, there's no way it was transitory. We were all experiencing at, you know, toilet paper shooting up the roof in terms of how expensive toilet paper was getting and other items. We were seeing shrinkflation. All these other elements were coming into the mix that were not being reported. And we felt we needed to track that. And so, you know, it's it's no longer, you know, shrinkflation. How do you track shrimp shrinkflation? You know, the different size packets. And you were alluding it to it. Is it with salt or without salt, right? Ingredients get extracted. Sizes get smaller. Uh, prices may stay the same, but the size is smaller. How do you take that into account in 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 a whole mix? And, and so those are all elements that we challenge our analytics team day in, day out to sort of filter out and and wait accordingly. Now, when you see that data coming in, uh, the next thing is you've got to have a methodology of how you actually calculate it. One of the big controversies or highly debated uh, components of CPI is that they created this basket and the basket has different weightings of the goods. And what is the basket? How does it work? They try to explain it, but I think people have a lot of questions. And then it also doesn't get at the point that like maybe you have different inflation experience than I do based on what I buy. And so how do you think about the methodology? Do you have a basket? How are you doing that? And then how do you also think about personalized inflation and and maybe trying to measure that? Yeah, I mean, we we have a we take a census-based approach, number one. Number two, the government takes a panel-based approach. So the way the government does it is they take a thousand households, they rotate those households every month and see how those households are spending and extrapolate that across the market. We try to actually aggregate real spending power based on credit card data, based on consumer patterns. We've actually launched on truflation.com slash calculator. You can actually go and calculate your personal inflation. We have a couple of profiles. You can find a profile close to you to simplify the input process. Um, And we will be launching very soon an anonymous credit card integration where you can just tie your credit card to the account and constantly be updated based on your spending pattern. What are you seeing over a course, a period of time? What is inflation and how is that impacting you um, on a personal level? And and so those are things that we're trying to add and aggregate more and more real-time data from the actual users themselves in terms of how they're spending it and then be able to personalize it into types of individuals or different categories, urban, rural, uh, you know, um, yeah, high, you know, tech worker, you know, a sort of factory worker, um, different la- ranges um, of, you know, suburban family sort of um, and, and, and things like that. When we look at suburbs versus urban areas, yeah. one of the things that is also happening is uh, there seems to be government spending, which may be at odds with monetary policy. So the Fed is tightening, uh, but politicians are stuffing liquidity into the market. And so even when you just look at the Fed's balance sheet or you look at uh, interest rates, you're like, oh, inflation should be coming down aggressively. If you actually go and you look at some of the month over month inflation numbers, it's telling a different story than the year over year numbers. And so how do you start to break out some of these nuances, suburban versus urban, you know, month over month versus year over year and and really try to get at like what is likely happening with inflation today and how will that affect my portfolio or how will that affect the goods that I'm going to buy? Well, there are two elements. There's the structural side of things that that are that we've seen and experienced through the whole COVID and and now sort of the the attempt to sort of become 
bring do more onshoring right as we bring more and more of the manufacturing onshore um etc that's a, what we call sort of structural changes and then there are the seasonal changes right where you see sort of spending patterns around the christmas time frame around the summer holidays all of these things have a, an impact on pricing and inflation um you know we just saw December numbers be announced in January. We're coming up next week to the January numbers. We see the January numbers come down over the December numbers significantly. Um, but we're also going to see a, 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 a catch up, right? So it takes time for businesses to adjust their pricing. So in some cases, and, and it's not necessarily gouging, you know, they've been, they've experienced inflation. They've had, you know, more sa salary increases. They've had cost of goods go up. Uh, supply chain costs go up, et cetera. Those take a time to filter through. And then actually before the pricing hits the shelves, it just takes time. And that might see coming back, uh, inflation coming back in the next couple of months. Um, and and so that that's sort of one aspect that we're sort of looking at and, and sort of how we sort of see trends happening, I'd say that's, yeah. Now, how can people use this alternative inflation measurement, right? It, one of the things is you got to get the data right. The second thing is you got to get legitimacy in the eyes of certain yes. people. Uh, and then the third thing is it can be implemented. Do you expect this to be a replacement? Do you expect this to be a complementary data source to CPI? How, how do you expect people to use it? Well, I mean, CPI is so entrenched. We don't see that us, us really having a big dent at the moment. The advantage we've had is a mistrust in the numbers that are being reported by the CPI. Uh, we like to view ourselves as a complementary data to be able to hold accountable the um, people that are actually doing the B or the people at the BLS actually calculating um, government-related uh, metrics. There is so entrenched. You have the whole federal system, statistical system that actually has some 13 different departments that are aggregating data across different different categories um and they then all sort of report overlapping numbers to some extent and what we're seeing is they don't actually even integrate with each other how can they use modern systems to be able to help them be more efficient have less headcount operationally be super lean report fast in real time no more with stale data all of those things we're trying to sort of help and and provide um uh, you know, it's just an alternative source of truth for this. Ultimately, um, our goal is when will people want to issue or when will institutions want to issue a, a loan or bond tied to trueflation? I mean, that would be sort of really a, a, a stamp of approval for what we're working on and what we've been, you know, sort of working the last three years on. Our methodology, by the way, is super transparent. You can go to the website, download the methodology. Everybody that has reviewed our methodology has been super impressed by the accuracy, the breakdown, the, the, the level of professionalism that has gone into that as along with that transparency. And, and apparently our website doesn't reflect that that easily, but you have different types of users, people that just want to come and see and quickly see the metrics. And then you have people that really want to analyze the details and the data. So we had to accommodate for both constituents. What's the response been from reporters? Like I find that they have a big uh, hand in pushing a narrative. Um, most of them do a great job. They yeah. you know, are trying to kind of figure it out just along with everyone else. Uh, are they starting to use Trueflation more often or are they still stuck on CPI as the, the say all be all? Today's episode is brought to you by Espresso, the maker of the world's thinnest portable display. Now listen up. If you're like me, you feel like you are at a command center when you sit down at your desk. I got a gazillion tabs open and different windows for different activities. There's my web browser, my text messages, I have Slack open, and I got a notes app. I normally work on a desktop and it can be very, very productive. But everything falls apart the second I leave my desk. If I'm traveling, if I go to a coffee shop to do some work, or just want to work from the kitchen table, my laptop doesn't have enough screen space. I lose my command center and my 
prime productivity falls off a cliff. It's a major problem. But this is where Espresso comes in. They have a portable screen that is so beautiful that you think Steve Jobs came back from the dead to create it. The thing is incredibly light. It comes with a nice stand. And the user interface is so easy that I figured out how to do it in less than three minutes. If you listen to this podcast, you know that's not an easy feat. So the Espresso team and I, we became friends. I got to know them because I really like the product. And those screens, they now want to offer them to any fan of the podcast. So we struck a little deal. Here's how it works. Anyone who listens to this podcast can go to us.espres.so. Or, that's too confusing, just go click the link in the description. If you go to Espresso's website, they've got a brand new offer there sitting for you. You get a little discount and you'll get a beautiful screen. Trust me, I use mine every day. You'll love the Espresso screen and I think it'll make you more productive. Go check them out today by clicking on the link in the description. No, I think we're seeing it grow more and more. I mean, we see different types of media, right? So um, the right, I mean, sort of Fox will then sort of always use Truflation as an alternative source of truth. Um, NASDAQ, the financial services sector, will use Truflation and always like to hear Truflation's opinion. But it's more just, let's get a different opinion. Let's have a different perspective. And we definitely provide a different perspective. Um and and the people that want to take it serious and and sort of front run the BLS numbers, um, they will use Truflation. And the people that want to just wait and see what um, the outcome is of the BLS, they will have their alternative sources to try and front run it themselves um, at, with some, whatever means that they possibly can. And when I say front run, I don't mean it in a negative sense. They're just trying to predict the outcome, and what they try to do is then trade on the in, you know yield um, associated with a lot of these interest rates, uh, inflation linked bonds. When you see the um, uh, inflation in the United States take off and then come crashing back down, um, at the same time, we have tons of bank executives and others saying that uh, a recession is incoming. But we also see the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell on 60 Minutes the other night saying, basically, everyone chill out. You know, <laughs> it, it, It's OK. Yeah. Um, are there other data points that you all think that you can start to get at that can help people be better informed outside of just the inflation numbers? Yeah, I mean, we're trying to get much more data. We actually bring in what we call leading economic indicators, which influence the future pricing of uh, inflation. So that can be the price of commodities, uh, the raw materials that go into, let's say, uh, EV vehicles, right? So all of a sudden I have copper, I have nickel, I have palladium, I have platinum. All of these elements go into the battery that's required to power EV vehicles. If we believe that EV vehicles is the next element, how is that going to impact the pricing of EV vehicles? How do we do that in the housing market, the price of 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 of, of wood, uh, in meat, groceries? If we still want to eat meat on the table, how does that impact the price? Supply chain, weather, all of these elements, how can we identify patterns and then get into the more predictability associated with it? We're really comfortable today to go three months out into predict predicting inflation um and and one month is is sort of automated now and and three months we still need a bit of human influence to identify some trends and be able to impl you know take in black swan events potential black swan events and then give that a weighting uh in the mix uh manually at the moment but we're trying to automate a lot of that let's talk about personalized inflation and you guys have yeah. this new product that's coming out in terms of being able to uh, essentially say hey here's what I spend money on like how much is inflation affecting me what yeah. is that product really going to do and and how does it work so i mean it's 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 basically you 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 go on you go onto the site uh you choose your demographic are you an urban professional a retired senior a suburban family and then it pre-populates based on the average spending uh the income that you get in in that and you can adjust each one of those elements so if you find your spending's a bit more or a bit less you can just adjust it but everything's pre-populated and then it just calculates what inflation is um for your household and then you know how does that impact your monthly spend uh, and what is the result of that and so those are elements that we will just automate 
One thing we are announcing is uh, in the next couple of weeks, we will be bringing out a anonymous credit card integration. So you can just give us your credit card details and you'll earn for sharing some of that points for sharing some of that insight. Um, and you will then be able to then actually just continue to spend with that credit card. And that data will be updated anonymously on your account so that you can then actually go and see without having to populate anything, how you're actually spending it and where inflation is impacting you most. Is it in your rent? If you pay rent with credit card though. Um, but if you're spending in transportation on your utilities, on healthcare, uh, et cetera. When you see the um, spending on my credit card, yep. can I actually predict if I buy this now versus if I buy it in you know ninety days? And, and I'm assuming consumer goods may be easier than some of these other things, but yep. um, you know, food I, I need the food now. I, I can't yep. not eat for ninety days. But yep. uh, on the on the, some of these consumer goods, um, is that possible at some point? At some point, we'll be able to do that up one month out. I don't think 90 days yet. We're not confident with that, but we'll be able to give you 30 days out in terms of what the price of these items will, how will they evolve over the next 30 days that we'll be able to do. Um, food items we update on a weekly basis. I mean, generally the price of eggs don't go up every single day. They change maybe over a weekly basis um, and things like that. Clothing update, we update it sort of pretty much weekly as well. Um, clothing seems to have come down significantly for some reason or other. Um, and, and I mean, largely due to uh, um, oversupply from Christmas, the overhang of Christmas. What has been the most surprising thing of working on this, right? I think everyone, again, controversy over inflation. People think that the government data is inaccurate. You now have spent three years digging deep into what they're doing, how they're doing it, what the methodology is, the data sources, um, you know, kind of all of the, the different inputs that go into calculating CPI. You've now built a system that you think is at least on par, if not better, could serve as this complementary uh, component. What's been the biggest surprise? Yeah, I mean, look at the level of interest. I mean, you know, we we got immediate support from Balaji and 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 yourself. I mean, you know, sort of really to 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 really build a professional product around this. We sort of started this as a hobby, didn't believe it. Let's let's go have a look. And and the level of interest just hasn't died down. I thought about a year ago it would die down, but it hasn't died down. And and people are really beginning to trust the metrics that we're bringing. We're still here, three years in. You know, we're still delivering actually more and more relevant components to this. That's been a really big surprise uh, on my side um, to see how this has grown. Um, the other element is 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 just yeah the the trust. Um, yeah, the lack of trust, the waning trust in in institutions providing um, you know. A, a th information through closed rooms. I think that's been a real big surprise. Um, and the growth, you know, the the growth that we've experienced, 8,000 unique users every month, new users coming to the site every month. And that ultimately has allowed us to then scale up on the talent that we've got in the team, which has been really exciting to experience as well. When you're <laughs> building something like this, the yeah. Aspect to me that I think is uh, most interesting is like there's economists, there are mathematicians, there are developers, uh, there's yeah. business development. How do you balance building a team where really you have kind of um, a very hard, you know, kind of scientific problem to yeah. figure out? But then you also have to go build the business itself. And and it, it's, it seems a little bit different than maybe software where you're just, hey, we write a software program, something breaks, uh, we can quickly, you know, I issue a patch and, and keep going. This feels like it has more gravity to the yeah. actual product and accuracy and, and things like that. So how do you go about building that type of team to, to make sure this is successful? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, startup, as you know, is, is not easy, right? I mean, it, it, it's pretty tough. Um, and and then, yeah, startup where you're balancing science, uh, you're balancing tech, you're balancing marketing, you need distribution, you need awareness. Um, balancing all of those definitely not easy. We started, I mean, we're from a tech standpoint, we're now building out V4, right? So we've constantly had to scale, adjust, redevelop, redeploy, and all doing that in parallel to actually running and operating a business, uh, having a good design, having a good user experience, having advisors on that help us and the support from these advisors has been really, you know, paramount to our success, you know, from Chainlink to Coinbase to Balaji to yourself, um, and then other macro econ economists that have really just picked up on, 
um, what we're providing and then pushing us hard in terms of how are we documenting this? How's this described? Are we doing, you know, you should be taking this data, might be more accurate, and then trying to crowdsource the data. I mean, that balance and then try to make money in parallel, right? A lot of people at the beginning questioned, how are you making money? How are you making money of this? You know, this is already for free. Why do I need another alternative source? Um, and so that's been a big challenge. Um, and I think, yeah, you you pointed us in the right direction, where to get money first and, and try to build this up. And so we started getting some customers, which helped fund the business, which helped us then scale and and, and raise another round of, of investment to really actually scale this even further. My favorite I mean, it's a constant, thing, you're, you're constantly chasing this, right? You just, it's a cycle where you're going small, you're starting trying to go bigger and bigger, and then you're just trying to just scale it, scale it each time. And you're hunting growth all the time. And how do you lead growth? How do you motivate a team uh, persistently, tirelessly? Uh, you know, yeah. My, my favorite thing that you guys are doing, I think, is um, you're using the tools that are available today. Right. Yep. And, you know, I always say that housing is a great example. Yep. Uh, you can call people on the phone and say, hey, what what did you pay for rent last month? Or, yep. you know, what do you think your house is worth if you <laughs> sold it? Um, but, man, is it much more valuable to just go on Zillow or, you know, Redfin or just name your exactly. platform and see what did they actually sell for and do it across the country in an automated fashion with real time data um, and constantly update over and over and over again what is actually happening with housing prices nationally. Exactly. I mean, that, that's really that. And it was it was amazing that nobody had actually done it. And then we actually found universities. So in the housing sector, we work really closely with Penn State University, who have a whole team of students that are actually crunching the numbers with us and helping us optimize the metrics so that we can stay up to nine months ahead of where, you know, the government reporting ends up. Right. And so things like that. And I, you just don't as you go in your startup journey, you stumble upon individuals and, and people that want to help out, introductions, opportunities, and it's how you capture those opportunities and convert them into the product that you're building and have a win-win scenario with the people that you're working with. They love us because we're giving them real-time data and helping them on the development side. And we love them because they're bringing an economic aspect to how we calculate the housing index, um, you know, which which is helps us just strengthen the protocols that we have. Where is the biggest risk for this not working? Right. As you continue to build this out, uh, everyone's excited. Everyone is uh, uh, looking forward to having an alternative measurement that's that's accurate. But most entrepreneurs are risk killers. So what do you see as the biggest risk that you've got to continue to mitigate over time? I mean, the risk, I mean, I definitely see a bit of a regulatory risk sort of coming in, you know, sort of sense, censorship oriented, right? I mean, you're seeing in Europe, they're already censoring, you know, social media because it's a narrative that they don't like. Canada's been doing the same thing. Will they do that around something that's tying to the scorecard of the performance or even underlying a $4.4 trillion industry? Um, that number one, um, I'm not too worried about it today, but maybe tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, uh, that might be an issue. Otherwise, sort of, um, it's getting into new markets. How do I scale? How do I get more regional? Uh, you know, that's a real challenge. There's a significant cost to going into more local, um, you know, the ability to then calculate inflation locally. Uh, how do I aggregate the data? How do I crowdsource maybe even at some point the data and the price feeds, um, et cetera. So those are all challenges I see risk wise. I mean, yeah, you know, it's just running out of gas or steam or, or energy to continue to drive this. But I think, you know, there's such an opportunity right now. Data is the new oil, leveraging AI to, to really use our and evolve our prediction capability. You know, those are all tools that we need to deploy. If we don't use them, I think that's another big risk uh, and challenge that we have. Um, trying to leverage the historical data and get smarter at what we're doing than, you know, any individual institution. When I see the United States being slow on adopting this, is there an opportunity to go to other countries and get them to adopt this more into um, kind of the, the sophisticated professional uh, world of economics, you know, monetary policy, maybe even some impact on fiscal policy? Yeah, for sure. I mean, 
The United States, I mean, it's not slow. We're, you know, we're, it's, <laughs> I mean, Australia only reports inflation on a quarterly basis, just as an example. And Canada's pretty advanced. Uh, the UK is pretty advanced in terms of systems that they've deployed to track inflation. Um, you know, I mean, opportunities are huge when you go to emerging markets. I mean, look at Turkey. We've been really, there's a strong pull for us to go to Turkey, a strong pull to go to Argentina. Now with Millet in charge over there, what is the impact of his reign going to look like, right? Over the next two, three years, how is inflation going to come down? How is he going to control inflation? What are the impact of his policies and his you know, cutting, you know, cutting of, of departments and regulations, how are they going to benefit the economy? And what does that mean for inflation in Argentina? Uh, those are all things that we're looking at, and they have a, a significant impact. Largely, I mean, why we focused on the US and why the US, number one, the systems there are the most are pretty advanced in terms of data access. Uh, number two is the U.S. dollar is still the currency reserve for everybody else. Everybody else experiencing inflation, they go to the U.S. dollar, right? It's the de facto currency where everybody goes when they're suffering inflation. And so if the U.S. has inflation, then there's no other currency to go to. Where do I go? Then the only other resort is really, I mean, it becomes Bitcoin, right? I mean, it's really very hard to balance that. And and yeah. And so we just feel it's our, you know, one of the tasks, how do we educate people? What is inflation and where is it in the U.S.? In which sector is it hitting the most? And how are people spending money the most? I mean, 20% goes into the housing, right? So if the housing market goes up, that has the biggest impact in people's inflation, right? As we've seen, um, you build this out over three years. Has there been anyone um, who's just been outright this is not going to work. Uh, you're wasting your time. Like a well-known investor, uh, a well-known uh, CEO, just someone that is like driving you to make sure it's successful. Yes. <laughs> Who? I mean, look. I mean, we started this off. The first we got a lot of uh, support in the beginning, um, and and you know, I we tried to raise money during um, a very tight market uh, during COVID. Um, I think I pitched some 1,300 investors and there were two or three that really, yeah, I just really wanted to show it to them and just, we'll, we'll get out there. We'll make sure this is going to be successful and I'm just going to die trying. And, and yeah, we, I think we've just really cut a curve just the last four months. We really had some sort of breakthrough, um, as the narrative with BlackRock coming into Bitcoin, with RWA becoming a stronger narrative right now, the tokenization of everything, um, you know, blockchain actually being a credible source of technology. Um, and so those are all elements that played in our favor. And we're using the blockchain for making sure that the data is immutably locked on the blockchain and anybody can go and verify the calculations. Um, we're just launching a decentralized um, solution, our definitive resource uh, point where we're going to enable across a decentralized network, the ability to actually build your own indexes off the verified data that we have that we actually store on the blockchain. And then my last question for you is, um, as this continues to get built, things like artificial intelligence uh, have become more prominent. Are there yeah. ways to use those new technologies to reinforce even further kind of the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, predicting, right? Everybody wants predicting. Everybody wants to read into the future. So how can we leverage technology with the granular 10-year history or 12-year, 15-year history that we have? How can we actually leverage all of that across not only the pricing of items, but also of the leading economic indicators and identify patterns, trends, and then extrapolate that, that excuse me, into the future? Uh, that's something we definitely are trying to work on um, and, and we'll be building out. Um, yeah, I mean, we're still in the early stages. I mean, we've just managed to sort of aggregate all the different data sets, the different formats, the different time intervals, and then make them composable. Uh, we're now adding third-party, uh, data aggregators to the mix so that their data 
becomes composable. And now how do we enable the prediction associated with all of that data around specific characteristics? I, I don't need to know the whole CPI, but I may just be interested in what is influencing the housing market. And then how can I build prediction in the housing category? How can I do that in transportation? How can I do that in the clothing sector or the, you know, sort of other elements versus overall on the whole um, CPI itself? Where can we send people to find you on the internet or if they want to learn more about Trueflation, either check out the data, the dashboards, or potentially become a customer? Go to trueflation.com, follow us on Twitter. And those are the two main sources where we give you updates. Uh, we share a lot of our information on, the, on those two platforms, either on our website, you can read everything on our blog and test out our calculator um, and, and let us know how we can Im improve it and make it better. Awesome. Stefan, thank yeah. you so much for this. I, I'm a huge fan of what you guys are doing. Uh, literally, I think since the first time I heard about it, I said, mm -hmm. oh, man, if they could pull that off, that'd be incredibly valuable. So hopefully uh, you're well on your way to doing that. And we will uh, definitely do this again in the future. No, thank you for having me again. And thank you for your your support. I mean, yeah, it was really right at the beginning. You were there in Miami. I remember you, you we were on a call. And um, yeah, it was super good support. So thank you for everything you've been and while, you know, working with us on this journey, right? It's been an interesting journey. 